morning to everyone i sajal student of dme media school welcome you all to vibrant india series episode 16 i also welcome all the viewers who are watching us live on facebook vibrant india series is an initiative of dme media school for celebrating 75 years of india's independence this series will be a year long exercise as part of the series we invite inspiring personalities for online talk interview and interaction with our students the invited personalities for this series are from all walks of life and from all parts of the country and today a special guest dr sanjeev chopra fellow of royal asiatic society london hra lmf sai harvard university historian columnist and festival director of well your words we welcome you sir I would like to take a moment and introduce Delhi Metropolitan Education to our viewers. DME is an A-grade premier educational institute affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh in the Prestige University, New Delhi, and approved by Bar Council of India. The institute offers BA, BBA, BLLB, PBA, BLLB, and BJMC programs. DME believes in imparting world-class education to its students while training them to develop. and enhance their skills this education and training enables them in taking up challenges of the industry and creating a space for themselves with their competence and vigor dme media school is one of the most promising media institutes in the country it offers ba in journalism and mass communication it is recognized as a school focused on the growth of its faculty and students through academic and co curricular activities major flagship events and initiatives of the school include bj vargis lecture series peer to peer ftp international film festival sifi international conference i can and vrittika convention of media students newly added to the list is vis vibrant india series it is our privilege to introduce you to the personality of episode 60 guest of the day is a personality radiating knowledge and wisdom dr sanjeev chopra superannuated as a director of lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration in march 2021 he has 60 36 years of experience in india's administration service dr chopra has served as the district magistrate of murshidabad he was secretary to industrial development and information technology department uttarakhand dr sanjeev chopra was the additional chief secretary in department of agriculture and industry west bengal he was the mission director for the national horticulture mission and the national mission on micro irrigation dr chopra was md for nafad and national horticulture board he holds a phd in management besides degree in law history and literature dr chopra held hubert h humphrey fellow at cornell and the robert S. Mac in the Mara Fellow at World Bank, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra has been elected as a Fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain. He is a Fellow and affiliate of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard. Dr. Chopra is a distinguished Fellow of the United Service Institute, India's oldest think tank of national security issues. He curates the Valley of Words, a literature and arts festival at Dehradun in every November. He is a columnist for several publications, including the print. Dr. Sanjeev Chopra is currently working in the political economy of reorganization of the states of India. I now request the technical team to show some glimpses from his life.
sir, for joining us today. It is indeed an honor to host you. I now request Dr. Susmitra Bala, head GME Media School, to welcome the guest. Thank you, Sajal. Welcome, everybody. Episode 60, Vibrant India series. We launched this digital program in 2021 on August 9th on the anniversary of Quit India Movement. And we presented episode 50 of this program this year on August 15th, when India celebrated 76th Independence Day. Vibrant India series is an initiative of BME Media School, Delhi Metropolitan Education. It is an online series to get inspiration from distinguished personalities. This program has been conceptualized and created by Professor Ambarish Saxena. Vibrant India series is a tribute to all those people who have made supreme sacrifices for the independence of our motherland. This program is a part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mohasab, a celebration on India completing 75 years of independence. Let us have a look at the eminent personalities who have graced the VIS during the last one year. Eight personalities from the Defense Forces have participated in VIS till date. These personalities belong to the Indian Army, Air Force and BSF. These include Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, Dr. P.K. Saxena, Professor R.K. Dargan, Captain Dharmveer Singh, Group Captain Ashok K. Chordia, and Mr. Virendra Kumar Gaur from BSF. This list includes a woman as well, Squadron Leader Prerna Chaturvedi. Eight personalities from the education sector comprising education planning, teaching, and research have participated in VIS. From the media and journalism, five personality participated in VIS, Mr. Rajesh Badal, Mr. Shambhuna Shukla, Mr. Sanjay Banerjee, Dr. Ashish Kulkarni, Mr. Suni Tandon, and Dr. Rajesh Bhatt participated in VIS. From the social sector, nine personalities, including eight women, have participated in VIS. These include Dr. Monisha Behel, Dr. Midala Tandon, Dr. Midula Seth, Ms. Tripti S. Hingal, Ms. Vibhala Khera, Ms. Bhavrin Kandhari, Dr. Meenu Walia, Ms. Minakshi Gupta, and Padmashri Jitain Singh Shanti participated in VIS. Seven personalities belong to art, theater, and literature participated in VIS. Two personalities from the field of Law and Human Rights have graced the VIS. These include Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha, Ms. Jyotika Kalra, and from the field of police officers, Mr. Amod Kant, Mr. Vibhuti Narayan Rai, Mr. Rajendra Singh participated in VIS. Three senior IES officers have also graced the VIS. These include Mr. Ashok Pradhan, Mr. Bemal Julka, Mr. D.J. Narayanan, who have a unique blend of bureaucracy, and Professor Veena Sikri participated in VIS. Mr. S.P. Raval, author, and uh, Mr. Augustin Valid, Mr. Sufi Sayyid Azmal Nizami, Mr. Balindu Sharma Dadichi, Mr. Satish Saxena also participated in VIS. Today, in episode 60, we have with us a distinguished personality, Dr. Sanjeev Chopraji, retired bureaucrat from former director of Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy, historian, column writer, and festival director of Valley of Words. Welcome, Dr. Chopra, in episode 60 of Vibrant India series. Welcome you all in this episode. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for listing out galaxy of experts we have hosted till now in VIS. 
I now request Dr. Amrish Saxena, Dean DME Media School, originator and ideator of VIS to take the program forward. Thank you, Sajan. Uh, so it is uh, indeed an honor to host uh, Dr. Sanjeev Chopla today. Uh, we started this uh, program last year and since then we have been lucky uh, to hosting very eminent personalities. Uh, particularly as the concept of this vibrant uh, India series goes, we have been trying to approach the people who uh, have been actually working on the ground. Uh, there might be some some uh, differences as to who is a celebrity, but for us, celebrity is a person who is really doing something good for the society and for the people. And that is how very, very distinguished people have agreed to be part of this conference. And uh, as this is being organized on India completing 75 years of independence, so we decided to have 75 episodes. So luckily, this is a good number today. This is the 60th episode and Dr. Sanjeev Chopla is uh, with us. So uh, as the program goes, if I can tell you, Dr. Chopra, uh, after this uh, initial segment, we will request you uh, to narrate your journey. Uh, narrating your journey uh, involves, basically, we would uh, be interested in knowing as to uh, how uh, you proceeded in, in your life, what all you did, and uh, along with the challenges and the uh, the, the, the problem that you would have faced all across, but then the important thing is uh, to be told to the young people as to how you uh, over uh, all those uh, challenges and moved in your life. Uh, I will also request you to uh, tell us some of your uh, distinct uh, experiences, some anecdotes, wherein there is something uh, inspirational for the younger generation. After, I mean, this uh, you can take for 15, 20 minutes and thereafter I will be putting up certain questions wherein I will request you to elaborate certain things that you would have already spoken and then the floor will be open in the last segment to all the teachers and the students who are there in this session and they would like to ask you certain things. So, so that is how this whole program is. So now without uh, uh, further wasting any time, I will request you, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, to please take the program forward <coughs> and uh, tell us whatever you want. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ambrish Saxena. It's really very kind of you to have invited me. Thank you very much, Professor Susmita Bala. And thank you, Sajan, for that very nice introduction. Uh, let me give you, send you greetings from Dehradun. It's a very nice, very, very pleasant sunny day. Uh, and you know, it's, it's absolutely, I send you good wishes from here. Because I can, from here, see both the Himalayas and the Shivatiks. And the air is very fresh. And I know when I send fresh air and, you know, uh, good, good, good vibes to Delhi, I think it means a lot uh, yes, to all of you. Uh, okay, friends, uh, I'm now in my 62nd year. And I'm uh, 61st year, actually. So. In a way, it is very nice that I'm the 60th episode, uh, having completed 60 lovely years uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. I was born in Kapurthala. It's a small princely state in Punjab. Uh, some of you would have known about it. Some of you must have heard about it. It was uh, it was a very nice setting. You know, I grew up in a. My father was in the BSF, so I grew up in a in a campus. I grew up in a in a BSF campus in the Punjab Bound to lease lines and a part of the Jalandra Kapo. Therefore, in a way, my childhood was a bit different from that of my cousins uh, and other relations because life in a cantonment and especially in a campus where you have a lot of uh, people from all over the country is very, very different because, uh, I mean, I had friends from all over the country because growing up in a cantonment town, you make friends from people who are not necessarily from your region. And I think that was a very different experience from that of my cousins who were living uh, and knew only people from around their neighborhood. So I think that is a very defining moment. And I think all people who grew up in a grew up in a cantonment town or in a campus, uh, I mean, our idea of India is is always a very inclusive India for the simple reason that you've met everybody uh, around. I mean, so you have a teacher in Mrs. Joseph, you have somebody who's a Nair, you have somebody who's a you know Pobragade, you have somebody who's a Srivastava, you have somebody, of course, you have the normal Punjabi titles always there. But that gave us a sense of India, which was a bit different from the sense of India, which a normal 
childhood childhood kid and uh, <clears throat> i enjoyed my school i mean i was always fond of studies and uh, it's something which i enjoyed from from my early childhood and uh, so those were eventful years i mean uh, uh, the 1971 war uh, i was just 10 years old at that time 10 or 11 years old at that time and that is to some extent part of the genesis of my book which i have written now it's called mapping the states of bharat uh, you know and it's the, the making and remaking of the boundaries of india you see one more thing that we must realize is that you see i saw india evolving as i grew up i mean you know himachal pradesh for example was made in 1971 uh just around the time of the india bangladesh i saw bangladesh happen in front of my own eyes so when you are 10 or 11 you are uh, you understand a lot of things you do you may not understand the, the deeper uh, and the and the, the long term significance of those things but those things do impact you so i saw the birth of bangladesh i saw the i saw the creation of himachal pradesh as a state and i uh, you know i i started uh, Well, I mean, and I was very keen to be a journalist uh, from uh, from my earlier time because I was very good and very fluent, and not only in English but also in Hindi. And uh, I was fascinated by the written, fascinated by the written. Uh, in fact, uh, I started reading, you know, the newspapers, Tribune, and and Statesman, and Times of India, and Union Statesman, and Illustrated Weekly. I enjoyed reading these things, and I always wanted to be a journalist, and therefore. Uh, i opted to uh, to study liberal arts rather than science in fact in those days uh, as ambrish and uh, susmita ji would know anybody who did not want to be an engineer or a doctor or a chartered engineer people would think he is a waste child like, what will he ever do in life so we had to face a little bit of that criticism kya you don't want to study you don't want to work hard so you have chosen these subjects like history and english literature and political science so i always enjoyed these subjects I did want to join uh, Delhi University, but I had completed my uh, those days high secondary at the age of fifteen, and I could not get admission to to any college in Delhi, especially Stephens, which I wanted to join, but I I, I couldn't join because I was underage. And then, of course, uh, once you join a college, then you you know don't feel like moving from there. So the um, academic journey began uh, with D A V College, Chilanda, moved on to. Kalsa College, where I really, 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 you know, uh, took off, because uh, in Kalsa College uh, the main emphasis was on sports, and at one point of time, uh, five of the eleven players in the Indian hockey team were from my college, from Kalsa College, Jhelum. But that also meant that you know I got all the opportunities of participating in debates and poetry allocation and declamation contests uh, from 1976 to about 79. So I had a Had a had a whale of a time, you know, participating in uh, in college uh, festivals across the country, and because you when you take part in debates and declamation contests and allocutions and discussions, you have to read a lot, you know. So your your general reading uh, becomes much more than the conventional reading because if you have to rebut a point or argue something, then if you are doing it from the conventional text, you will be caught. So per force, I had to. i had to read more and i enjoyed reading and uh, so that was it that i was very keen to uh, to become a journalist so i started writing at a fairly early age and then i joined jnu when i was 18 uh, i joined jnu that was a very different experience very different experience but uh, i had a i mean i had a little accident so i came back to khalsa college jalandhar and while i was doing my masters i applied for and became a trainee journalist for the times of so that is something which you know because you are a media school uh, you will be interested in knowing that i started my career as a trainee journalist in the times of india in the year of the lord 1982 3 days before i was 21 so i was still a student of ma when i got my first job in the times of india and that was the most exciting i mean even getting into the is was not as exciting because there is some charm about the first job there is some there is some you know there is some uh, something very remarkable about the first job so we were packed off to bombay as it was then called mumbai came later so we had the times of india training school in uh, in bombay and our training manager was a was a, was a journalist by the name of patanjali sethi patanjali sethi was a well known writer illustrator storyteller 
and very, very strict in his training to us. And, you know, he taught us how to do check P's and Q's and spellings and all these things. And uh, I learned a lot in that period in the times of India training school. You know, um, I wonder if you know, Ambrish, that in those days, uh, all newspapers had to keep the obituary columns ready because you never yeah. knew when somebody was going to die. And those were the pre Google days, pre internet yeah. days. So, how do you produce an obituary? When suddenly somebody died. And I remember working on the on the on the obituary of Janel Singh Tanunwale, takes your ping, and I forget the third person whose yeah. obituary I was supposed to work on. All of us, one of our first jobs assigned to a training journalist was to update the obituary. And that the Times of India would do every three months because you never know when somebody is going to die. In, in fact, fact in, a friend in, of in mine. Fact, in Sorry, fact, if I, I can if, if I can interrupt here, I remember when I was working with a pioneer and uh, Kamla Pati Tripathi was an ex uh, chief minister of UP and a veteran uh, mm -hmm. politician uh, in India. Uh, he, I mean, every day we were feeling today he will die, tomorrow he will die, and like <laughs> this. So we, we uh, as a journalist, we prepared the complete four-page supplement uh, which we were supposed to produce on his death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that kind of preparations used to be made because as you said, there was no uh, internet or no such thing wherein you can instantly produce something. So you yes. have to be prepared for all such things in advance. Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure one of my friends uh, later, I mean, the late DP Tripathi, uh, who, who you know was uh, uh, was with the I mean he's again a remarkable political career with CPM. Yeah, yeah, I, I know I know him personally. So, I know him personally so, because I have also got my education from Allahabad University. And Achha, he was, okay. DPT yes, was, he was there. A legend there. So DPT told me he says, hey, uh, is my name there?" Because that was the bark of whether you bid it or you got bid it. So I told him, boss, abhi to aapka obituary nahi bana. This is to bana do ya. <laughs> so can you imagine that? I don't know. The younger children will, you know, really, you know, look at it in this way. That how would you know that you made it? You made it if you have your obituary ready in the Times of India. And obviously, when I say Times of India, I'm sure the other newspapers like Indian Express and, you know, Jan Sata and the other, they would also be doing the same thing because you said in Pioneer, you had this to discuss. <clears throat> so, uh, so Times of India was there, uh, and you know, the training journalism, uh, training journalists. You see, now of course the model is changed. Now the now the newspapers uh, have set up their media schools, and you are expected to pay for it. But the Times of India, I think, was the last of the great uh, uh, institutions, a great scheme by which you know young people from across the country, from middle class backgrounds, could do, go and join and. We've had a, had a string of very prominent journalists coming from that training journalism school. So one of the things in training journalism was, you know, that you were assigned to different desks. So three months in film fair, three months in Times of India, three months there. And I, uh, you know, wanted to come to Delhi. Uh, and so I was assigned the Times of India News Service and then the Economic Times News Desk. So in fact, and I, at the end of my training, I was still working in Economic Times on the Sunday section of economic time. So that's where I got confirmed. And a lot of people felt that I'm a very distinguished economist because uh, obviously I was working for economic times and my visiting card said sub of the economic times. So I was working in the Sunday section of economic times. But I used to write lead articles and things. And you know, I remember taking one of these lead articles at the age of 22, uh, you know, a series of lead articles. I'm pretty sure you would know the significance of that in economics. I took them home to my father and said, they go, I mean, look, look, this is what your son is. He says, Ye kya hai? what is all this? If you have something that you crack the IAS exam and show me that you can do. I said, you think you, you think I can't make it? He says, no, obviously I think you can't make it because you've chosen the softer option of, you know, seeing your name in print every day. It's a very soft option. So I said, no, I can crack it. He says, but if you can crack it, then crack it. I said, but I am already working now in Times of India. And, you know, so my father, being an old, uh, I mean, uh, a very intelligent man, I would say, he says, okay, you take six months leave and I shall give you exactly the money that you were getting uh, in the Times of India, treat it as leave without pay and I'll pay you. I will pay you exactly the money that you were getting in the Times of India to sit for the IAS exam. Now, I'm sure all parents, I mean, children, parents of children are going to give the same offer to their children. 
I don't know whether it is, whether I should tell you this, or I should not tell you this, but this is what he did. And a great man that he was, he said that, look, now I'm giving you six months full salary to prepare for the exam, and you better do a good job. So, thoda, you know, it led to a little ego issue also. Abrisha does create a little, you know, that you think, you, especially whether we are parents, you know, you feel it that, what do you think? Dad, I can't do it, I will do it. So that's what happened, you know. So I uh, took leave from Times of India, economic time, that's technically it was from the economic time, and uh, decided to prepare for the exam. And fortunately, by the grace of God, I was able to clear it uh, in one go. Uh, otherwise, I, I, I must say it would have been a very, I must now tell you the story, the very interesting story. What happened was that, uh, you know, I, uh, I mean, I, I had done my, my interview at one of fabulously. And uh, I was therefore thinking that, you know, I should be somewhere in the in the very top of the civil services list. So I went back to the Bootla and I took another 10 days off uh, uh, and I went home and I started, the, the day the results came out, um, I found that, you know, nobody is happy at home. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no celebration. So I thought they're yeah, unhappy that I'm not, that I'm not, got the top position in the UPS side. So I told my, my father had gone to Jalandhar, so I told him, my mother, I said, doesn't matter. So IPS hoga, income tax hoga, to hoga, but you know, it's not that I won't make it. So <clears throat> he said, no, your name is not there. I said, how come my name is not there? So first you look at the list from top to bottom, then I looked at the list from bottom to top, and I actually saw that my name wasn't there. So I was very upset, you know, I mean, you know, you can imagine from thinking that you're going to talk to the UPSC and people are going to come and interview you and uh, being a minor celebrity uh, to nowhere being there. So anyway, I felt very frustrated. And meanwhile, I had, you know, uh, had the offer with India today. I mean, I didn't take that up. I mean, I had uh, got my selection in the army. I, I mean, I was not really, I was so confident, so overconfident about it that I had ignored all those offers. So I, in frustration, I didn't want to stay home. So I took the, I, I started off for, for I thought, let me go back to Delhi. So I reached Jalandhar station and that day the Shane Punjab got cancelled because of, you know, a lot of violence in Punjab those days. So I had to take a train and, you know, bus and train. And I reached Delhi at about 10.30 at night. And I found that uh, when I reached uh, my cousin's home where I was staying, there was a big party going on and people were, you know, celebrating and this. When I reached that place, so the 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 uh, our chap there, he says, "I I a collector sahab." I was so upset with him also. When I went up, I found everybody celebrating. I said, "Why are you celebrating?" They said, "Because you made it." I said, "But I did not see my name there." You remember that Indian Express used to carry the thing that we are not responsible for any any the one full paragraph of twenty six names had been blown off at <laughs> night ship chat. So. In the Punjab newspaper, in the Indian Express, the, my name wasn't there. And when I reached Delhi, so then they, they showed it to me in Statesman, they showed it to me in Times of India. But I said, no, I don't believe all this. Let us go to UPSC. Those were the days when security was not all that uh, pronounced. There was a sole Delhi policeman chap at the UPSC. He says, kya ho gaya? Can you result? Dekhna? So, log dekhe chale gaya. <laughs> That's what the policeman said. He said, jitka ho raha tha. Anyway, we told him that he let us in. It was very sweet. You know, those days, actually, there was no there was no great security in Delhi. I mean, it's only post, uh, you know, all these assassinations that things have become very different. So we went there and I saw my name and, you know, then, of course, there was a, then I felt, yes, it, it's there. So in one day, you know, you know it's, it's a great example of, you know, how things change, you know, you feel... You, you can be down in the dumps and the very next moment, you know, you would have made it. And then, of course, the journey in the IS started. And one thing which I wanted to share with all my friends is that all posting in the IS have been to places that I'd never heard of. Uh, you see, he, what happened was that in 1984, uh, after the uh, situation in Punjab, Assam, Nagaland, uh, Mr. Damram decided that you will not be given your carder on the basis of the merit list, but you will be rotated. So it was, you know, you got your card by rotation. So I landed up in Westman. Uh, some of us decided to go to court. We hired Suli Surabji, but 
but we couldn't fight with the government because half the people were very happy with the new system because they got, uh, I mean, those who were, you know, lower down the scale, they got uh, better, better states at times. So anyways, to cut a long story short, I reached Bengal and I found that I was posted as assistant magistrate and assistant collector of Purulia. Now, I had not heard of the name. I had not heard of this Purulia. Uh, and then, of course, when I joined Purulia district, it was nice. And then Purulia had been part of the, and that is how, you know, a little bit of now I was trying to, to link history with, uh, with what I'm saying. You see, Purulia's earlier name was Malabhum district. It had been part of the old Bihar. But <clears throat> Purulia part was always a Bengali speaking area. But it was part of the old Malabhum, which was, and it, in fact, at one point of time, Bengal and Bihar were just one state. It was only in 1911 that the first separation took place, and in 1935 that the next separation of Bihar from Reserve. So I was just looking at what is the what is the significance of this word Malabhum. Now you see it. I realized then that, uh, in fact, a lot of gazetteers also said that this area of uh, which is now Singhbhum, Birbhum, which is the area where Shanti Niketan is, and Malabhum, which is the Purulia, Singhbhum, all this area. This area had been captured by, or had been conquered by Bir Man Singh uh, under the, uh, as the, as a general of the Akbar's uh, uh, army. But by that time, Bir Man Singh had already reached the highest Mansab rank that could have been given to anybody who was not in the royal family. He already had the highest positions in the civil service and the army hierarchy. So then they said, all right, how do we honor you? So they decided to name this area after Bir Man Singh. So it was Bir Bhum, Man Bhum, and Singh Bhum. So this entire area of Bengal Bihar, which was uh, conquered by, by, by Man Singh, so that was named Bir Man Singh, and I happened to be in Purulia district at that point of time. And Purulia, uh, amongst other things, the topic of cancer passes through it. In any case, we had settlement training. So what happened was that that was the time when the general life agitation started in Dajan. So we were doing our settlement training camp in Alipur Duar when <clears throat> the district magistrate from uh, Darjeeling came and asked us how many of us are willing to go and work in Darjeeling because there had been a boycott of, uh, I mean, there was an election boycott had been announced and there was a lot of anti-Bengali sentiment running in the hills at that time. So three of us opted to go to, uh, to, to do election duty in uh, Darjeeling and I was one of them, so I got posted as BDO Kalimpong, and then later I became SDO Kalimpong. Uh, and Kalimpong is now a district, but those were, so that was a very tumultuous period uh, because you were fighting the GNLF agitation, and there were several attempts at my life. Uh, one lived, uh, one missed, uh, you know, it was a touch and go situation many times, but one also uh, realized and understood the significance of the of the paramilitary forces of the army, of the need for coordination, of the need, you know, of, of opening a dialogue. And in fact, one of the first things which I remember doing uh, as the SDM of Kalimpong was to put a little board in my office saying, Deya Garira, Maikuma Shasaklai, Nepali Mekaro Pura Karmut, that please talk to the SDM in Nepal. So I think talking to the people in the local language, reaching out to the youth, reaching out and connecting, and, you know, being available to people during distress. I think that made a lot of difference. And I think that is the hallmark of a young uh, IS officer or a young IPS officer. He or she must make himself or herself available during emergencies. Because in a normal situation, in fact, a good situation is one where people do not know who the what the administration is. I mean, in an ideal situation, people should not know who the policeman is, who the postman is, who something. Because system must go on. Uh, and I quite agree the, with the view that we have to be anonymous during normal times. But that whole thing must change during an emergency. During an emergency, you must be visible. During an emergency, an IAS and an IPS officer must be known and they must come out and they must show to the people that they are not scared, right? So I was in Kalimpong and I really enjoyed my tenure there as well. That was also the period when I got married. Uh, Kalimpong again figures in, the, in my book, which I mentioned because uh, Kalimpong, was next to Sikkim. Sikkim had just been um, integrated to India. And uh, Kalimpong, again, has a very interesting history. I mean, the Queen Mother of Bhutan uh, 
uh, used to stay in Kalimpong, you know, and so was the first chief minister of Sikkim, uh, Kazi Lendu Torshi. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I got along very famously with all of them. And it was a very nice experience. I was very young and uh, I was treated very well by all these very senior people. So about one year I was there and then the GNLF accord happened. And the first thing which Gishing wanted was that all these people who were part of the, uh, or what he felt was, uh, were, were taking part in the anti-GNL operation. It was not anti-GNL, it was, it was a, I mean, we were there to protect law and order, but obviously those on the other side would look at it differently. So there, I was posted as SBO of Haldia, uh, but there was a high court order uh, against Haldia being made into a subdivision. Bengal is famous for litigation, as you would know, wish. I mean, we, we, we put up a high court, you know, high court gives a stay like this. I mean, you know, it's like ordering coffee from, uh, from a shop. So you've got to, there was somebody who gave a stay. And so I got posted to another interesting place called Ghatal. I had not heard of the place called Ghatal. Uh, Ghatal was part of the old Tamarlipti district. Uh, the old Tamarlipti district, which was a very important port town. And you get records of Chinese travelers there, Fahin and all these people. Because before the Calcutta port and before the Haldia port, uh, you know, ports have this very interesting habit of, you know, uh, getting, uh, you know, pitched in and, you know, getting sand. So ports, naturally, ports would shift their thing. So Tamalipti or, or Tamluk, now it's called Tamluk. So Haldia is now a part of Tamluk. So I learned more about Katal. And because I realized that nobody knows much about Katal, so I decided to write an yearbook on Qatar to, you know, get it passed. In fact, there were many things. Guru Nanak had visited, uh, had visited Chandrakona uh, on his way to Dhaka, you know. So it was part of the old trade routes. And another thing which is there is that, you see, as the railways came up, the old port towns and the old river towns, they lost their importance because railways became the most important uh, destination in the city. So if you notice, you know, the land around the railway station, that became most important. Cinema halls would come up close by, like aero cities, like, I mean, the 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 air, airport is the new railway station, right? The railway station has not lost its importance, but very significantly, all new developments today, I mean, land prices are shooting up near airports uh, rather than the railway station. And that is what would have happened many, many, many years ago when all these uh, towns near rivers, which were important uh, riverine trading posts, they lost their importance. So anyway, so I really enjoyed my, I mean, we enjoyed our stay in Qatar also. It was a nice, we call it, place. Again, a direct recruit IAS officer had been posted there after a long, long, long time. Mr. Ravi Indra Singh, who's the chief secretary of Punjab, he was posted there before me. He also incidentally was earlier in the Bengal card and had gone on deputation uh, during Blue Star to Punjab. So Qatar, again, what I mentioned was that one had not heard of this. One day when I was sitting in Qatar, we got a letter from the <clears throat> government of West Bengal saying that the there is a national management program that is happening in the MDI at Gurgaon, which was a very new institute. So MDI Gurgaon was very keen for you know people to join the national management program. I when I got that letter, the letter clearly said that you have to have nine years of service before you can apply. But I applied all the same. I I thought that if the government has, you know, sometimes government circulars are sent without without properly checking whether the letter should go to you or not. So anyway, the letter came to me and it said that you can give a free CAT exam. And uh, so your CAT is free and you sit for the exam. So I asked for station leave to sit for the exam and I got the station leave also. I sat for the exam, qualified the exam, got admitted to MPI and then I went to the government to ask for permission. They said, but you haven't completed your nine years. I said, but, but you send me the letter. I didn't, I mean, I didn't write to MPI directly. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the government said, Chale jau, you go for one year to MDI. So it was nice. It was again coming back to education and for a student of literature and history to get a management education was a very, very different field because I learned about maths, what related methods in management, about projections, about USPs, about you know, environment, policy. So an MBA, uh, especially if it is a government expense, uh, is a very nice uh, thing to do. So I was, I mean, so I was virtually forced back into, into academia at this. And then I did a, a report called Management Systems for District. That was the time when computers were just about coming in. IT systems were just about taking shape. So, and after that, I got posted to Kuch Bihar. 
uh, that is on the borders of Bangladesh. And uh, so when I went there, uh, that was the year when the decision had been taken that we shall hand over Teen Bihar to Bangladesh. Now, a little bit about Teen Bihar because, you know, <clears throat> what happened was that when India and Pakistan liberated, I mean, became independent countries, uh, districts were assigned to each other. So what happened was that between Kuch Bihar and Rangpur, there were several small revenue areas which were left on the other side because when kings used to play chess in the evening or they used to play cards in the evening, when they ran out of money, they would give the revenue of a particular village to the other side. So what happened was that the Raja of Kuch Bihar had given the revenue villages of several areas which are now in Bangladesh, the revenue had been assigned to. Now, ideally speaking, at the time of partition, those enclaves of Bangladesh in India should have become part of India and those enclaves of India and Bangladesh should have become part of Bangladesh, but it did not happen for various reasons. Uh, and there, you see, the, the, the constitution also has a role to play in that because the constitution of India says that this is the territory of India, which means that no more can be added and nothing can be sealed. So in spite of the Nehru Moon Agreement uh, to transfer these enclaves, it could not happen. And there were high court uh, Supreme Court cases which said that you can't do it. So finally, it was decided that that while you cannot hand over territory, there is no bar to India leasing territory to Bangladesh. So that is where I got, because of my history background, so I got pulled into writing the white paper for the Teen Bega Agreement. And we, we did that. And uh, so interestingly, at that time, there was a lot of opposition to Teen Bega for political reasons, you know, because what... So what is the situation today is that in 1992-93, we had given Teen Bega on lease to Bangladesh and, the, and it used to be open from morning to evening, sunrise to sunset. Then now it has become a, you know, 24 hour, it, it's open. But technically, now it is on permanent lease of 999 years to Bangladesh at a lease rent of rupee one, which the president of India has agreed to waive. So for all the younger people in this hall, you must know that, you know, when political settlements have to be made, there are ways they can be made. You know, so the letter of the law is important. But the spirit of the law is equally important. By the letter of the law, India cannot hand over an inch of territory. I cannot even take an inch of it. But if you implement the spirit of the law, then by this agreement of 999 year lease at rupee one, which is waived off by the president of India, so you have circumvented the law, right? For a positive step. So that is what I wanted to share with you. So that is was in Kuch Bihar. Then by that time, you know, Mr. Kishing realized that you know. Uh, uh, these people whom I threw out of Darjeeling were actually good. I mean, they were not bad people and they are the only ones who can speak Nepali. They are the only ones who can connect. So he said, send them back. So I was brought back to Darjeeling as the uh, as the CEO of the Himalayan Milk Union Limited, something like what Amul is, you know, and uh, also the uh, CEO of the Siliguri Jalpaiguri Development Authority. was there for three, three and a half years. Did a lot of development work, I mean, linking um, so some of the important steps that we did was we created this uh, this mill grid between India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, because Bhutan has a lot of butter, you know. Uh, Bangladesh needs a lot of cattle feed. Nepal has surplus. Siliguri was the big town. So, uh, you know, so even before uh, SAR came in and many things came up, we had set up a little agribusiness grid of commodities in North Bengal at that time. So that was a fascinating thing. Uh, one uh, interesting, uh, I won't say change, but intervention that I did was that, you know, as per the Food Adulteration Act, milk has to have a certain thickness. I mean, it has to have a certain fat content and a certain SNF content before it can be sold. But the hills, but the cows in the Darjeeling hills, and for that matter, hills anywhere, I mean, they, the, the, the milk is much thinner. You know, the milk is because they're not, uh, I mean, they're not big, they're not hefty, and they have to walk a lot. So then we were able to ensure that we got the PFA rules amended uh, to sell cow milk in uh, in Siliguri as per local specification. Then uh, the course of my history, life history, my my son was born in Kuch Bihar. That was a very nice time for us. Then uh, I got uh, I came to Missouri Academy for a six to nine uh, year training program. And during this training program, I was posted as DM of Balu Dhaka. 
but the director here did not allow me to go. I was feeling a bit upset that, you know, when you become a district magistrate, for the first time, there's a certain charm about it, like the first job in the time. So I felt a little bad, but then there's nothing much that you could do about it. But fortunately for me, three months later, Murshidabad fell vacant and I became the collector of Murshidabad. Uh, Ambrish, I've written an article on Murshidabad in the print. I hope you can circulate it to our, to the, to those who have joined here. See, Murshidabad was India's most prominent district because it was actually the capital of India. That is where the Battle of Plassey was fought. That is until 1796. It was headquarters of British, of the East India Company. It was only in 1796 that the capital moved from Murshidabad to Calcutta. So in many ways, Murshidabad was also the capital of the East India Company, which controlled a lot of it. I mean, it was not uh, it was not the de jure ruler of the country, but as we know, de facto the power had moved to the East India Company. And I lived in the house; it was built by Lord Clive. You know, and uh, so now Murshidabad has been uh, has been has been trifurcated into three districts. You know, uh, but I enjoyed my stay there. One of the biggest districts in the country. Way back in 1994, the population was about 65 lakhs. And, uh, you know, we had 95 kilometer border with Bangladesh. So we went for border talks in Bangladesh. So it was a nice, nice experience. So then I joined the Missouri Academy as a deputy director because I've always enjoyed teaching. So six years I taught here. And this was the year when I, years when I got. Even in one year, I got both the Bakumara and the Hubert Humphrey Fellowships. So I requested uh, uh, McNamara for a one-year deferment, which they agreed. So it was very nice. So I could spend one year at Cornell, and uh, and then I spent one year uh, doing the McNamara Fellowship of the World Bank. And the theme that I had chosen was, you know, the, the theme, the general theme for that year was mediation, consensus building uh, amongst nation states. I think I'm taking too long. Should I stop or yeah, no, no, but but then it was too interesting. So that is why I did not interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Uh because whatever you were talking about, that is also my area of interest. I have also done my masters in political science. Uh, in uh, I've done my LLM and international relations and international law it has been my subject. So I was very keenly listening to whatever you were telling okay, us. But I certainly looked up and I found, found that, you know, our time is nearly up. So let me, yeah. should I rush through it or should I just stop here? Uh, yeah, I think I will be asking you one or two questions and then I would like to, that the students ask questions to you. That will be more pertinent. Okay, sure. Uh, but one thing, one question I would like to ask you because you refer to uh, in so many such things which uh, normally appear very complex areas as you talked about uh, the borders, the, the, uh, the, the geographical, uh, I mean, relationship between Bangladesh or like we we have a lot of problems with other neighboring countries as well. And there are different notions with regard to patriotism, nationalism, whether we sacrifice our land and at what cost we'll be doing it. And incidentally, the uh, number of students uh, in this uh, gathering, they are from uh, uh, bachelor's degree, this BJMC first year, wherein they are studying a paper uh, on contemporary India, wherein they are studying a lot of such issues which you were talking about. So can you uh, give some understanding to these students in very brief, how do they they handle or how do they understand such kind of issues? We are in the patriotism, nationalism, the, the, uh, the, the pride of the nation. I mean, all such issues are involved. How can you okay. give uh, let me, let easy me... understanding of all this? Yes, yes. Yeah. See, I think, you know, one of the things that we've got to understand is that for a long time, we thought that there is only one strand to define patriotism, that there is only one line which will, I think, you know, the reorganization of Indian states has shown that, uh, well, let's look at a national anthem. Uh, what are the national anthems? This is Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Marat, right? Which means that you're a proud Punjabi and you're a proud Indian, you're a proud Maratha and you're a proud Indian, you're a proud Naga and you're a proud Indian. So this whole thing that, you know, one India, one thing, this is all very nice, but India has always been complex. India has always been uh, been, uh, been, been been many, many things. There's a strand of unity which runs through everything. There's a civilizational entity which is there. But the very national, you see, compare our national anthem with, say, the national anthem of Bangladesh. 
national anthem of Bangladesh. Again, very interestingly, during that India Bangladesh cricket match, this time you found that very rarely do you find that the same poet has written a national anthem for both the things. So, first, that <laughs> Amar Shunar Bangla. Now, Amar Shunar Bangla is only praising the praising the beauty of Bengal, you know. And 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 in fact, Tagore probably had the whole Bengal in mind when he wrote that. But they have adopted. And then was our national. Look at our national. Our national anthem says, acknowledges, recognizes, celebrates the provinces of this country. Let me take you back to the very first shloka of the Gita. So the very first shloka of the Gita is, Dhritarashtra Uvach, tell me Sanjaya, which armies are fighting on both sides? And then Sanjaya goes on to describe that, you no know, Chedi Raj is on this side, and this Raja is on this side, and that Raja is on that side. Now, in the Kurukshetra war, for example, Everybody is part of Bharat stroke, Mahabharat stroke, Jambudri. But all have their own identities. All were fighting under different flags. Right? So having, being a proud Naga, being a proud Mizo, being a proud Pajabi, being a proud Tamilian, being a proud Deliwala, and being a patriotic Indian is perfectly fine. I mean, <clears throat> loving Nepali, loving Bengali, loving Pajabi, loving Urdu, loving Hindi, and loving English, because English is also an Indian language. Just nothing takes away from being Indian. Nothing takes away from, uh, from from this. And I think this is the strength of our country. This is where we have scored over our neighbors. Because when you do not recognize diversity, uh, you know, you break up. So I think recognizing diversity is very, very important. And, and celebrating it. I mean, a class which has only people from one region. As I said, you know, living in a cantonment uh, and having class fellows who are from all over the country, I think I've become a become a better human being and a better Indian. And my understanding of India is certainly better than those who who, who got caught up in, in small parochial uh, thing. And that's what they go said. Let not my nation, uh, you know, uh, break into domestic wars. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, uh, I will uh, request uh, students who are eager to ask uh, questions to mm. Dr. Chopal to please come on camera and yeah. ask your questions. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I just want to ask you, can you share your experience at the Harvard University and how uh, that experience helped you in carving your uh, life? No, my I am currently a fellow at the Harvard University, but this is based out of Delhi. It's an honorary assignment and uh, I might go there next year, but uh, it's an honorary assignment uh, post my retirement. I've got this uh, fellowship with, the, uh, with this thing and I'm I'm helping them curate a course called The Many Ideas of India, which I'll share with Ambrish and maybe we can run this course at the at, at our institute itself. I mean, I'm doing the same thing at Rihanna Institute of Public Administration, the few other state ATI. I'll share the links with Ambrish and we can run it here as well. Uh, let me tell you about that. That really we looked at uh, at nine texts or ten texts that have shaped India from 1900 to 1947. So 1909, you got Hind Swaraj by Mahatma Gandhi. You got the Uttarapara address by Siri Aurobindo. And you also got <clears throat> uh, Veer Sarvarkar writing on the first war of independence. Uh, <laughs> a current controversy apart, which uh, in which he's been dragged in uh, by, by the political leader. The fact is, for the first time, the word first war of independence was used by him. Before that, the term used was mutiny. Then we come to 1917, when Annie Besant gave the presidential address to the International Congress. And that was the first time any woman had given an address to any any national political conference. I mean, it had not happened in Britain. It had not happened in the US. It was the first address given by a woman to a national level political conference. In 1932, you had Bhagat Singh come out and say, why am an atheist? It's a very different track. So you have Uttarapara address of Siri Aurobindo, which says that India's destiny is only spiritual. Mahatma Gandhi, who does not believe in just political salvation, but believes that, you know, unless Suaraj or Suraj comes, it has no meaning. 32 is also the time when Ambedkar wrote waiting for a visa and then he started waiting for annihilation of caste. Again, two very important texts. Again, very different from the from these texts. In 1939, Veer Sarvarkar again wrote uh, why Hindustan must remain one. And his concept of being Hindu is very different from the current notions of what we accept as being a Hindu. And in 1940, you know, I said that Pakistan must be created, Lahore address. So these are some of the addresses. And what I would want, uh, I mean, the professor Sakana do is that you should, students should examine each of these texts. 
you know, and yeah, the context I mean, in which this was given. And then we can have a broad discussion on this. Yeah. This is what I'm doing for Harvard. This is what I'm happy to do for, for your institute as well. If Ambrish is happy with it. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Chopra, many of the things that you said, I keep on telling them the same thing. You simply made my task easy by expanding okay. this. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah. Rajan Mishra. So what are the lessons or experience you had being fellow of the United Service Institute, how this organization actually works? Uh, okay, you see, USI is a think tank which has uh, mainly people from the Army, Air Force, Navy, some foreign service officers and some of us. So we take up, you know, various themes every year for discussion. For example, last year, uh, the theme that USI was working on was uh, 1971, the War of Liberation, you know, with, with Bangladesh. So you're looking at what are the implications of this war. You know, one is that you win a war. Uh, the other is that you have created a new history in the subcontinent. You know, how, how nations go to war. Like a war is not a simple act of the army attack. It's the army, air force, BSF, logistics, railways, food corporation of India. The entire nation goes to war. So that is what this year, for instance, with them, we discussed a theme called securing India at 75. So, you know, we've secured India at 75, but in the next 25 years, the security challenges will be very different. The security challenges will come from cyberspace, the security challenges. You see, today, the national assets are our nuclear stations. I mean, the Srihar Kota launch, that's a national asset. The Bhakra Nangal is a national asset. So you don't have to win 10, 10 kilometers of territory in Punjab. That has less meaning than being able to destroy, you know, for, from from uh, from from the point of view of the adversary, if Bhakranangal is destroyed, that is much greater damage than losing you know ten kilometers of land. And similarly for us, being able to destroy like we did during Balakot, I mean you know destroying some of their air bases, destroying some of the naval assets is far more important than entering ten kilometers toward Lahore. I mean that doesn't matter. So the whole nature of war, you see, earlier wars were being fought for territory. Wars are being fought for ideological reasons. Well, I mean, wars have always been fought for ideological reasons. But today, capture of territory is not a major, major, major issue. Right? So the nature of war changes. So with USI, we do the securing India at 75. You know, some, we did two years ago, uh, USI, we were looking at 100 years of the war. You know, because remember that in the, in the Second World War and in the First World War, Indians were participating. Indians lost their lives, but Indians were not fighting for themselves. We were fighting for a foreign empire, which was over us, right? So these are some of the things that we keep fighting. What is going to be the nature of war? What's going to be the nature of strategic strike? What are we going to be doing with POK? Now, what are we going to be doing with the sky chain? Are we going to be settling our borders with, with China? Do we do? I mean, because, you see, it's one thing to be saying that, you know, we will do this, we'll do. But obviously, China is also a powerful country, right? So it is not that you will say, ki, uh, it's not like a conversation between me and Abri Saxena. Friendly conversation. It's not a friendly discourse, right? It's a it's a contest. So in this contest, we got to understand what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and also the challenges of being able to compromise. It is not easy to compromise. And yet compromise is a must in life. You know, when those people who say compromise, in the sense that we've got to be realistic. So strategic institutions, and that is the difference between strength and strategy. You know, strength is just sheer strength, but strategy is different. You know, that is why human beings can uh, can do much better than elephants and lions and tigers who are physically far more powerful than you and I are. Hello, sir. Namaskar. First of all, I, I want to th thank everyone for such an amazing lecture. Sir, my question is very basic and I think every student want to ask this question. Hey, I read your bio and what I see, you tried every field, whether it is law, IS, agriculture. So my question is that what makes you motivate to get knowledge from different, different fields? Okay, let me put it like this. You see that <clears throat> I joined, when I joined the IAS, when I joined the Times of India, I was a simple, I was studying my former master's, right? So I completed my master's while I was in India. I told you the story of how I got my MBA. I mean, I, I mean, it was not planned. It just happened, you know, that I just got my MBA 
uh, because the government sponsored me, so I got my MBA. Law, what happened was, you see, that one realized as secretary, when I was secretary to the government of Uttarakhand, that we would make the laws. I mean, the secretaries draft the laws, and then they go for a legal vetting to eminent lawyers. And I found that in 2002-2003, the laws which were drafted by me were going for legal vetting, and the lawyer was charging three lakh rupees. So I thought, post-retirement, this will be a good thing to do. You know, so why don't I do my law? So I picked up my law when I was... I was about 42 years I mean, when I started doing the law. So I finished it. So, you know, then I thought I might become a legal expert in betting laws. So that's how the process of law started. You know, that's how I started doing the law. Some of law we already learned I mean, while you are doing your IAS training. So we are taught CRPC, CPC, IPC, Evidence Act, and, you know, laws of succession. That we already know. So some more I had to pick up. I mean, but I knew basic law because when you are trained for the IAS, you, you are trained in law. And some more papers in law I did. So then I got my LLB uh, so that now legally I can, you know, wet laws. I mean, so I've got many other things to do. So I didn't get into that area. But that's that was the, that was what you can say. I mean, chalte chalte, you know, I thought we should lobby. Kar so that's how I got enrolled in law. And those days, you know, it was this, uh, this norms of attendance and all these things are not as stringent as they are now. I find that every year these are becoming more stringent. Likewise with my PhD. You see, I had done my, uh, for my, uh, McNamara Fellowship. I've done a lot of research on uh, on agribusiness consortia in India because of my experience in Nimble. So that led to a major work for the World Bank. And that I was able to convert into a PhD. Because those days getting a PhD was much easier. Today you have to pass through, you have to do many of these exams. So I mean, we got our PhDs in good days when, uh, when you know things were much easier. Today doing law while working and doing PhD while working is far more difficult. So yeah, I, I think mean, I lived in better times. Yeah, so today, I mean, you cannot do a law uh, unless you are doing it full time. Uh, yeah. As per the Bar Council regulations. And again, today you cannot do a PhD part time. You have to have the coursework and everything as a full time student. So okay. obviously, now it is, it's a bit difficult. Uh, okay, so moving on, the last question will be by Gauri Dhyani. Yeah, Gauri. Greeting to one and all present over here. Sir, myself, Gauri Dhyani. I'm from BJMC Batch 2022. So, sir, as we all know that you are the, uh, you were the director of Lal Bahadur Shastri and you have IS maybe 36 years served. Kiya hai. So, sir, I just want to ask that you wanted to, you know, uh, be a journalist and had keen interest in that. And, but basically, you have apne father ki sunke clear kiya first attempt clear kiya is officer ka jo ki i think so it's not that much easy itna easy nahi hota hai aaj kal aur mushkil ho gaya hamare zamane mein itna mushkil nahi acha aaj kal to 9 lakh log baithte hain hamare kitne i think i got 9 9 10 lakh people pe aur is zamane mein to 50 60 hazar log baithte the so you know things are much easier it was not easy i won't say that it was the cake was but today it is far more difficult let's put it like this. but sir आपने उस अपनी जो इंटरेस्ट था आज के टाइम पे सर सर अपने इंटरेस्ट को फॉलो करते ही हैं कहीं ना कहीं पहुंच ही जाते हैं वहां तक बट सर आपने क्यों नहीं किया आपने क्यों स्विच नहीं किया मतलब अगर मैं शायद किसी बैंक में होता या किसी और जॉब में होता जिससे मुझे मजा ना आ रहा होता देन आई वुड हैव सेड दैट आई आई डोंट लाइक दिस डिसीजन बट आई एंजॉयड ईच मोमेंट ऑफ इट आई मीन ट्रेनिंग वाज वंडरफुल क्रूलिया वाज वंडरफुल जीएनएल वाज वंडरफुल सो आई मीन देयर इज नॉट बीन अ डल मोमेंट इफ दे हैड बीन अ डल इफ दे हैड बीन अ डल मोमेंट देन दिस क्वेश्चन दैट यू आर रेजिंग सॉरी दैट वुड हैव कम टू द फोर बट दैट डिड नॉट हैपन and the other thing was that i kept writing throughout i mean i was having a column with Narwal post i was having a column with you know with with fair observer with with observer mainstream epw statesman tribune i would keep writing for them book reviews i've always been doing so nobody says that if you are in the is you, you have to give up on reading and writing i mean i've been continuing on book reviews all throughout and some day we have the time uh, we'll discuss some reach the i mean how the books that you read they shape your life you see uh, because before I joined the MBA, I was unaware of Peter Drucker, I was unaware of management duties, you know, all, all these things. But then with MBA came one set of knowledge, with law comes another set of knowledge. Each job gives you a different perspective. 
So it's a and 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 the IAS is actually a knowledge organization. I mean, it's not a run-of-the-mill organization, right? So if you are say the I mean, when you are secretary of industries, it's not just you're not just clearing files. You got to understand industrial policy. You got to understand fiscal policy. You got to understand monetary issues. You got to understand land. You got to understand technology. So if you are a thinking civil servant, in fact, all the legislation in this country, without meaning any offense to any parliamentarian, who drafts it? It's drafted by us. I mean, the, all the policies are actually drafted by IAS officers. So there are, within the IAS, there are some who, you know, who get into field jobs and other things, but those who come to ministries and who work in the state government or in the government of India, we are the ones who actually, I mean, who draft the policy, right? I mean, the political statement would be made elsewhere, but actually, how should panchayats run? How should cooperatives run? How should an industrial estate run? How, what would be the exam policy of the country? All that is done by us. It gives you a lot of chance to read and write. Yeah. Thank exactly. you so much, sir, for inspiring us. And it's been a great session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So that is how we uh, move towards the closing of this session. It was really a very enthralling, very interesting, very engrossing session for everybody, those who were there in the session. Though normally in all our sessions, Dr. Chopra, there is a large participation of his students, but the number with which we started right from the beginning, uh, uh, that remains the same even after more than an hour. This means how engaging your session was. And uh, if I talk about the takeaway, there were so many things which uh, in a way were passed on to all the younger people who are there in this session as to how one can keep studying lifelong. Uh, because whether you are in administrative services or in journalism or in academic, one should learn how to read more, how to learn more, and how to get uh, studying different kind of uh, subjects, different kind of uh, uh, areas, like as you did, right, from history to law to management and all. And uh, uh, this also, because we, we are an educational institution, so this is also something which we must understand that... Uh, now, nothing can be a better uh, experience uh, than uh, reading, writing, and learning. So if that can be uh, infused among the young people, then obviously they will be a better professionals, whether they stick to journalism or they opt to go to uh, public relations or advertising or even because it's a bachelor's degree. All the civil services. Yeah, yeah, even That's civil services. Right? I, yeah. I hope some of I hope your parents are listening. They'll definitely tell you. Okay, give you six months of your salary. Prepare for the civil services. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we 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 have those uh, groups of the parents, and we invite them as well, send invitations to them. But they hardly join. But after this is done, because it will be on the YouTube. So YouTube uh, uh, videos we send to everybody, including the parents of these uh, students. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so uh, we, we learned a lot uh, and uh, there was a better... And to Amrish, it was mutual. I enjoyed it as well. It was very yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you. thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. And thank you all the people who remained there and participated in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. God bless. The first impression that comes to our mind about any college tall buildings, big classrooms, large lobby areas, thick books, IT labs, assignments, class tests and projects, nothing besides that. Every hour, minute, second spent here help us carving and shaping our persona, cultivating innovative mindsets for the challenging world. Learning is a lifelong process, sharing knowledge, inculcating values of life, spark the innovative horizons of mind. Fun and frolic is the nature of every nook and corner here. A daily dose of thrill we are sure to get here.